Hi, welcome into a new edition of Top Shot. The program in which we are going to talk to Sunita Narayan today about the various issues for which she has been fighting. You know where Sunita has become a household name because many housewives, many kids, many people think that she is fighting for them. So Sunita, welcome to this program. Thank you, Suresh. Now what are you busy in these days? Fighting for what? <laughs> the fights are the same, Suresh. Fighting for clean air, fighting for clean water. And it's getting tougher every day, as you know. Uh, cities are growing, cars are growing. Uh, we have more and more diesel cars on our road. Uh, most cities today are very unhealthy when it comes to breathing the air. Uh, so we fight, but I hope we'll win also one day. Yeah. But tell me, Sunita, why basically I don't think there should be anyone who should be opposed to the idea of having more cars on the road. Nobody should be opposed to the mm. more well-being of the people. Mm. But is it really required that in the process of acquiring more economic wealth, mm. we, have to en we have to ensure, mm. in a way, that quality of air has to deteriorate, have to ensure that quality of water has to go down? Yeah. Why it is happening? Is it not possible that we can have both economic well-being as well as absolutely. environmental concerns? No, absolutely, Suresh. And I think that's really the big issue today that this country faces, perhaps even the whole world faces. How can we have both? Because we want growth. We, we particularly in a country like India where there are large numbers of people who do not have even any form of mobility. You know, we do need more and more cars on the road. Our per, per capita car ownership today is still very small when it compares to the rest of the world. The question I think that a country like India must ask, and I think that's the big question, is that do we have to go through the pains of pollution or can we leapfrog into something much better? For instance, I would argue that in our cities today, instead of promoting cars the way we are promoting it, subsidizing cars, today we have cheap motorization because we do not pay for the cost of the car. We do not pay for the parking that we require for the car. We get excise duty cuts on the car. Instead of the government promoting so desperately a private motorization, if the government was to put in the same incentives into public transport, you could still buy your car, but you wouldn't need to use it because your cities would be so well connected, whether it came to a metro, a bus, or a light rail system. But if you look at the hard facts today, the fact is that a person who drives in a bus pays five times more tax than a person who drives in a car. So public policy needs to be corrected. Yeah. So what you're really saying is... Uh that government has to be very clear about where the public policy direction should be. Absolutely. Now, in a country like India, where uh, more than uh, half of, uh, rather, more than quarter of the people who live below poverty line, mm. and in a country where 80% of the people almost earn less than $2 mm. a day, they can only afford public transport, mm. obviously. Mm. So, therefore, the public policy should be in fear of, uh, the public policy should yeah. be in fear of public transport rather than favoring private transport. Absolutely. But then, uh, this is a real simple logic. Yeah, absolutely. Impact. But why you think, uh, where is this failure of the part of the government, not just a government or a B government, government, successive yeah. government, to capture this reality? No, I think, Prabhuji, this also really, you know, baffles me. I mean, it is so good politics. I mean, after all, we do very strongly believe that public policy should be for the poor. In this city of Delhi, which as you know has the highest, one of the highest per capita incomes of India, 60% of people still commute by bus. 20% still bicycle to work. So you're absolutely right in saying that if you want public policy, it should actually be promoting mobility for all. I believe it doesn't happen because I still think two things. One, we are locked into a mindset where we are trying to catch up with the world. We don't have the arrogance and the confidence to believe that we can do better than the rest of the world. In spite of everything we say, I think all our top planners today still believe that we must be like New York. We must be like London. We must catch up. And catching up means that we must have, as they have, more cars. But we do not have a vision of our own to say we will do better than them. We will actually rebuild our cities in a way that it will be convenient for all. And secondly, quite frankly, I would say to you, and the harsh truth is, I don't think governments today take decisions. I think corporations take decisions. And I think when it comes to an issue of a car versus a bus, the fact of the matter is that the car lobby is much stronger than the bus lobby. So the finance ministry will reduce the excise duty on cars, will not tax diesel, will allow a 
car to be driven on diesel which is subsidized and kept lower for public transport even though they know that they add to the under recoveries of the oil companies but they will not do anything because the car lobby is so strong so the hard truth is and i think it's something that the profession of uh, parliamentarians should really think of that you are losing control you are no longer in control it is corporate india which is ruling india and therefore i don't get the bus but i get pollution yeah transportation is one area in which uh, mm. i know you have been mm. fighting for it i remember the days when uh, the supreme court heard That's a petition right. from csc yeah. about type of fuel that should be used mm. in delhi mm. i know that the cost of public health has to carry mm. because of uh, the ambient air quality being deteriorated mm. tell me something about uh, that fight how mm. how did it start mm. really Do well, you remember, uh, Suresh? At that time, Delhi was really polluted. I mean, you know, that was mid '90s. You couldn't breathe in Delhi. You would always feel as if there was something hanging over you, black hanging over you. When we took the matter to court, we essentially had argued that Delhi should not take the incremental steps of the rest of the world because the rest of the world had cleaned up fuel. We said, let's change the fuel itself. Let's leapfrog. and by moving to compressed natural gas you got emission levels which were not even in europe at that time so you got an advancement you got that jump ahead and you will remember you were in fact very much with us at that time how much fights there were and that every time the matter was heard in court a bus would burn mysteriously the night before a cng bus because there was a clear way to sabotage the whole yeah. program uh, there was a lot of um, pressure i think to me two lessons that i learned out of it one change is always difficult in any society and there is no doubt about it that when you are asking for something which is dramatically different it is difficult but then if it is difficult you need proponents who will stand for public policy and for public good and you need to have information you need to be able to fight it out publicly to be able to argue that that change is necessary even if it is tough it is necessary and i think with cng it's a it's a remarkable turn around today delhi has much lower air pollution levels than other cities of india you can breathe in delhi you can see the stars in delhi most days and uh, most nights and i think uh, that is really the big challenge and delhi today realizes that if it doesn't control the number of cars the gains that it made will be lost and we are sitting at a time when beijing as you know yeah. is fighting for its olympics and yeah. clean air in olympics and they close down the factories and they are telling people not to drive on the road on the eu olympics to make Absolutely. sure that the quality of air remains good Absolutely. you know uh, this public transport is one hmm. area on which uh, hmm. we have been fighting and i have been uh, observing that for hmm. a long time uh, tell me uh, particularly when you talk about fuel you mentioned hmm. that you moved from uh, diesel to hmm. cng but you know in any case both are coming from the same family of yeah. fossil fuel do you think uh, it is about the time that we should in india should think about something radically different a country of 1.1 billion people should we wait for rest of the world to discover alternative fuels or should it be a new leap forward from india itself to say that we like to discover a new source of energy is it something we should try to do no absolutely i mean i think india has to think big think out of the box i think let's be very clear the oil prices are volatile and even though there are indications that they have dropped to about 120 most people say they are not going to go below 100 yeah. and today your oil um, your entire oil pricing is done at $80 $88 i mean so there's already the oil companies are bleeding and they will bleed further yeah. and i think it is time that india realize that two two challenges one we have to become more efficient with every drop of oil we use and that means as i keep saying the bus is much more efficient it carries 100 yeah. people a car carries two people okay. so on efficiency that's the answer yeah. the railways is an answer we need to think big about these solutions which are more efficient yeah. in in that sense as two we need to think about something completely different now it is very clear and you know this even more than i do and you know you know the energy field so well that you know the options right now are limited we all know that i mean we have thermal we have hydro we have nuclear and we have renewal renewable now the renewable package is basically wind and solar geothermal biomass i mean those are the four technologies of which 
Wind is a mature technology. It's competitive with the other technologies. Solar, the rate, the price is so high that you need a major breakthrough and a major investment to be able to bring down the price. And biomass as well as geothermal are very localized solutions. Now, I think what India really needs big time is to do massive investments in solar because that is the only technology today which is the technology perhaps of challenging fossil fuel of the scale that is needed. Right. I mean, very clearly we need more energy. Right. You come from Maharashtra, which is talking about right. what crippling power cuts today. 8,000 megawatts of shortage. Almost. Or shortage, you know. We need more energy. But clearly solar and clearly efficiency and clearly more distributed power. I mean, another problem we have is today we are losing so much energy just in right. transporting it. Yeah. So this could be all this, what you talked about, could be the alternatives for electricity. Uh, in a distributed generation basis mm. as well as to grid connectivity. That's right. But as a transportation, we need alternate fuel. So probably for a long time, we thought that we have found a solution. Mm. The win-win situation in which biofuel we touted as one of mm. the great success stories. But now down the line, we are thinking, mm. having a lot of apprehensions. Mm. People are worried about it. So where do you think the biofuels will feature into our future mm. energy options? You know, Prabhuji, I think very clearly no option in the world today and I think that's something we all have to start realizing. No technology option is an absolute option for the world now. It's not a static because option. It's a dynamic reality. It's not only that. I think no technology today is capable of dealing with the needs that we have in the yeah. world. Yeah. I think the first thing we'll have to do is to say we have to curtail demand and then find right technology. So lifestyle changes will be as important as a technology change. Right. And I think biofuels is a classic example. If you talk about biofuels and you want to have as many cars as you did yesterday, forget it. I mean, in America, the figures in the U.S. are that if you were to convert all the corn crop, all of it, into biofuels, into ethanol, you would replace 12% of the current gasoline use. Yeah. And gasoline use is going up, not yeah. down. So it's, it's a drop in the ocean. Now, if America was to say that we will curtail the growth of cars, we will move towards public transport, and we will s use biofuels for public transport, then biofuels can be an option for the future. And I think that's the creativity that we will have to bring in, that no technology today can provide you in with climate change, with everything else happening, with energy security issues. You will need a mix of technology and lifestyle changes. So what you're saying is uh, not just supply side option in terms of replacing one source of supply with another, but also stop from the demand side. Absolutely. And that's something which is both will actually going to finally Absolutely. converge demand side solutions as well as supply side options. And demand side solutions will demand changes in lifestyle. That's right. And that we will have to learn. It does not mean that we get poorer. It does not mean that we have to become, you know, I, I was in a recent program with a very leading industrialist, industrial uh, house, uh, I mean, an association head, I won't name him. But after I spoke, he spoke. And he said, well, you know, if all what Sunita says we do, we will learn, we will live in the caves once again. And I essentially find that mindset a problem, that what you and I are discussing today is not about going back to the caves. We are not talking about getting yeah. poor. Frugality, as I keep saying, does not mean poverty. Yeah. Changing in lifestyle, if you were to drive in the most sophisticated bus in your city and you were to actually have a metro system which was you know, connected to the bus, does not mean that you and I will become poorer. A car is not a sign of richness. A car today stuck in a traffic jam is a sign of stupidity yeah. because you're losing time. Most of, most of the people I meet say how much time they spend on the road. I mean, as I keep saying, get a life rather than getting a car. <laughs> so you're saying don't be poorer of ideas. Absolutely. You can come out with good ideas, better ideas to solve the problem that we face today. Absolutely. So now tell me, uh, you... I just mentioned about changing lifestyle. Hmm. In fact, uh, for me, it has always been a conviction that lifestyle hmm. change is a real solution. Hmm. And we have nobody else to turn to to look at that uh, reality hmm. is what Mahatma Gandhi taught us actually. Now tell me, you know, I realize one thing, hmm. uh, having been the government myself, hmm. Hmm. that lifestyle change is not something which can be brought about by change in laws. No. It can be, probably, hmm. to some extent, but not to hmm. great extent. So there I think there is a huge role for a civil society organization like yours hmm. in which you can influence the people's mind, help them to change their thinking. Hmm. So what, what do you think really how government should help the civil society hmm. organization to shape 
together this mm. common concern that we have got mm. how to change people's mindset mm. in the process change the demand cycle and therefore have a limited supply mm. side option mm. so how to do that i think Sreshi, two things are needed one i think um, we have to learn that lifestyle changes will demand good public policy. Yes. So that you also that said. I and I think we can't only leave this to an education sphere. I mean, however powerful all of us as educators may become, if the public policy is to make the car cheaper and cheaper and cheaper right. and make the bus more right. and more expensive, I mean, I you and I can't do That's anything right. about it. It is like, it. A, so a I tap, uh, it is like a tank in which there is an outlet which taking the water away and Absolutely. then whatever put you put in this building. Absolutely. So I think first, I think public policy is critical. And I think in today's world where it is absolutely clear that if we want to become energy secure and water secure and food secure, we will have to change the nature of public policy. Okay. I think first trigger I would say is that. I think in that it's a role of education as well because my belief is that public policy if it is supportive to environment will be supportive towards the poor and supportive towards equity. Okay. And therefore I think it also makes for good politics. Yeah. And I it is our failure that we have not been able to put that public policy out as boldly as clearly as possible to say this is good politics because this country needs good politics the amount of tension you're seeing today i mean every industrial project is today facing resistance and industrialists tell me it's only because there are some vested interests i keep saying it's not just vested interests it's also poor people who are fighting for their right to survive and that you know, you will need a better compromise between development and the needs of poor people. And that's good politics. So, so just coming to this point mm. that you mentioned, uh, and I agree with you completely, mm. that you need a proper public policy support. Mm. It's like a war when you're fighting the war. You also need air support. Absolutely. When the army is moving in, and Absolutely. then you also need a naval support probably Absolutely. to ensure that nobody attacks you from yeah. the sea. So now this aerial support probably should come from public policy. Mm. I agree. Now tell me something. Uh, what should be the ideal platform of exchange of views between the government which actually formulates the public policy and civil society organization like yours what type of a platform you think is an ideal one wherein we'll be able to shape a good public policy which is actually addressing these concerns that people have i think it's the role of parliament and i think we need more spaces in parliament to do so my own sense today is that um, you know, governments are receptive. I would not say that this government is not receptive towards public opinion or public policy. But I think what you have today is such a lack of capacity in government to actually think out of the box and think creatively. Um, and you have the public policy space has been taken over more and more by vested interests. So government is actually struggling to decide between the vested yeah. interests of A versus yeah. the vested interests of B. Yeah. Okay? And that's become the role of government. It's a middleman between two vested interests. And that is where I think parliament has to play. A, I cannot think of any other forum yeah. which has to play a no, role in breaking parliament that. Could be the forum. Well, how you think, uh, what could be the way, because this is something which uh, parliamentarians also will be very welcome yeah. to this idea of uh, interacting more with organizations like yours. Tell me what could be the parliamentary forum that should really look into it because this could be one of the reform one could bring about in the parliamentary debate and public policy formulation uh, basis. For instance, Sureshi, we talked about the parliamentary forum on water and you are you're very much a member of that. Now, I mean, it would be very good to look at that parliamentary forum on water and to see what are the various parliament, what are the key issues which civil society believes are critical for water security. And then if the forum can work with organizations like us, and there are many others, in bringing that information to bear to government, but in a very structured and a very aggressive manner. Because I believe today the time for sitting around and talking is yeah. gone. If it you're serious about it, then you have to get on to it. Yeah. And if it's a street fight, you get on to it. If it's a road fight, you get on to it. If it's a, another kind, you just have to be at it. And I think that's the kind of somewhere the engagement we need. I mean, climate change is another issue. Energy security is another issue. Uh, the issue that we are very concerned by, which is the growth of toxins in, in, in our food, in our water, is another issue. But again, you know, we need ways in which you can have a powerful way of 
holding government accountable. And that's the parliament job. In fact, parliament has to exercise control over the executive. Absolutely. That's why you think the parliament is a good organization. In any case, parliamentarians represent the people and you also Absolutely. try to derive Absolutely. your strength from the people. Absolutely. So you think there's a convergence there. Absolutely. And I must say, in my experience, and you know this, I've said this often, I think parliamentarians are very aware, perhaps much more aware than anyone else of what's happening in, in, in the country. They have their pulse. Yeah their hand on the pulse. The problem is today in the structures, the role for parliamentarians to play a very aggressive and a structured role to hold government accountable is there through your committees, but I don't think it's powerful enough. And I think that I space think has that's to That's something be which you, again we really need to look into how the parliaments can play that role generally, yeah. if you and others. But Absolutely. we'll talk about it a little later. We are talking to Sunita Narayan, Director of CSE, the person who has been fighting many battles for people of India. And we'll continue talking to her a little after some time. We are taking a small break. Don't go away. We are talking to Sunita Nara. So welcome back in Top Shot program in which we are talking to Sunita Narayan, Director of Center for Science and Environment, CSC. Sunita, we are talking on, uh, you said very interestingly that how we should change our thinking, how should we change our lifestyles, how we should bring in parliamentarians to change public policy. You know, one of the issues that uh, always agitate any member of parliament mm. and something which has not yet entered a public policy debate as much as it should have been is the issue of water. Yes. Absolutely. You know, we probably one day can live without energy. Yeah. In a sense, the type of energy that yeah. we used to. Mm. Because in any case, 45% of the people in India mm. live in darkness anyway. Mm. Then others, 55% live in darkness for about 7, 8 hours, mm. 9 hours, 15 hours, mm. depending upon the load shedding mm. timings in that area. Mm. But no one can live without water. No way. Now no. tell me, uh, why you think uh, despite the fact that water is something which is so mm. critical for mm. human survival, for biodiversity survival, mm. still we are not able to focus on that issue as the top priority for the country, which has we are only 4% of the water of the world. I think what I have found is every time I have spoken to parliamentarians, they understand this yeah. issue. It's so a top it issue. Day. They face it every day and I am sure they understand the desperation because it is a desperation. I mean, and. I think the problem is that every time we look at water, we get lost in the technical details of water. Yeah. So we don't look at water as a politics issue. And it's a political issue. Water is about rights. Water is about a technology option which is most affordable, most convenient, and most reachable. Where we have to put water back into politics. And I think it's, you know, uh, many years ago it was said that every time you make a ministry for something, you finish an issue. <laughs> and I think. In some senses, what we ended up doing is, it's not about the Ministry of Water Resources per se, but the fact that water has become a governmental issue, we tend to think of it, are wo engineers solve karenge, wo engineers batayenge kya karna hai, baand banana hai, ki maha par kuch aur karna hai. You know, it, it's become a sort of help, you know, people feel very helpless and disempowered. But on the other hand, when I think about it also, Suresh, if you think about it since we, you know, we've been talking about this for so long now, I mean, look at the way people are now beginning to manage their water. You're also seeing a revolution in this country where people are building water bodies, they are protecting water bodies, ponds are coming back to life now, rainwater harvesting is becoming part of the dictum of water management. And I think that is there. But I don't think we're doing enough. When I really, water is an issue which makes me cry. I understand because uh, this is something which brings water into the eyes of so many women Absolutely. of India because Absolutely. they are the ones who have to finally suffer because they are the ones who have to fetch water for the household like they are mm. supposed to be the mm. responsibility of the no, women absolutely. alone. But you know, on water, one issue, Sunita, you mm. highlighted and I think mm. uh, no one did that before mm. you actually mm. ran a campaign Anil. on it was on huh. quality of water. Yes. 
you think uh, after so many years of uh, independence uh, because water was always flowing into the rivers mm. and it was available to the legs mm. then we found a solution of yeah. taking it out from surface below yeah. the surface from the ground water but tell me quality something why we, we never had any legislation mm. on quality of water why we never had standards mm. which we must stipulate in india mm. for a potable drinking water why Absolutely. not you know i think a very good question and i think what's happened is like you said we had so much so we never worried about it we thought our rivers were polluted but our drinking water was not polluted and we somehow felt that we would be able to deal with it but today we have a double burden i mean we have a burden of a poor country which is polluting its water because of bacterial load because we have so much excreta and so much sewage that we cannot treat and on the other hand we are also a modern country so we have the growing toxins which are polluting our ground water whether it is pesticide whether it is chemicals which are polluting our water today and today every municipality is finding it impossible to clean water and to supply it and as a result what's happening is that you have these massive the big multinationals are making huge amount of money by selling us bottled water and that bottled water i think is a scam because at the end of the day you take a plastic bottle you transport it long distances using also emitting huge amount of pollution and you bored a, a whole a well somewhere taken out the water you don't pay a penny for that water to local communities you don't pay for water so you and i buy that bottle for 12 rupees but we haven't paid a penny for the company hasn't paid a penny for the price of the water so with bad water coming to us in our homes business is growing and that business i believe is only a business for the rich what will happen to the poor of india the poor of india will die. you know today even water borne diseases are the biggest problem in the country and i think it's completely unacceptable we have to fight it we have to change it we need standards for potable water and we have to learn that we cannot first pollute and then clean up we will have to reduce the amount of pesticides we use the amount of chemicals we use so that we first do not poison our water and then say now we will invest in expensive technology to clean up right water again is one uh, sector in which a lot of convergence takes place mm. for example 83% of the water is used for agriculture mm. now the way we have agriculture practices is also going to impact on policy on water so water is one subject which is not just water specific policies but probably we need a different sets of policies coming from different sectors from different ministries mm. which are handling those responsibilities so you think uh, in the government for example mm. if you have to think about one institutional mechanism mm. to look at what issues what issues ministry mm. is not a right forum because there are no control mm. over what agriculture mm. ministry is doing there are no control over what urban mm. development ministries are doing so what do you think should be the structure for dealing with water issues in india mm. well, you know i i have sort of realized that never try and reorganize government because if you do that then you run into so many tough wars that you never manage to do anything i think you have to devolve the water wa issue of water lower rather than centralizing it on top which will be difficult to do today already you have made panchayats more and more responsible for water and in the states where panchayats have to play a greater role in the management of water you will see convergence happening because convergence is not necessarily only at the top convergence is best done at the bottom and i think that is beginning to happen but i think the issue that you've raised is not just again an issue of coordinating policies it's about defining rights one of the big issues in india is that if you look at the rest of the world most of the water used is actually used in the rich countries in industry and in urban areas yeah. and agriculture uses a very small segment 20 30% in india it is reverse we agriculture uses the most industries and um, oh. urban areas small but remember as our industries and as our urban areas are growing we will we get huge demands for water growing over there but